It's an honor and privilege to uh, have our colleagues from uh, Europe join us. And uh, one of those individuals is Dr. Uh, Stefan Plotke, who's the chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology uh, in Salil, Germany. And I probably did not pronounce that correctly, so I'll let him uh, help us with that. Uh, but uh, it's, it, we've had a great relationship over the years, and we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, give us an update. So this is a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind invitation and having uh, the chance to um, to talk to you. It would have been a pleasure to see you in person, to be in LA again at the House Ear Institute. And I would like to start with a little reminder. I went through my old photographs yesterday and um, um, hang on. Yeah. And this is uh, my first uh, visit to Los Angeles in the House Ear Institute. This was the House Ear Temporal Bone Course in 1999. That was also the first time I met Bill Slattery. Um, and this, that's me in the upper corner here. And um, I learned a lot there. Um, and it was, uh, you know, uh, maybe it was one of the initiating, you know, things that uh, kind of sparkled again my um, my um, fun in doing temporal bone surgery, doing ear surgery, and so on. And you see here, we were invited by Howard House's house, and we had a great evening. I also was invited to give a talk about my MD thesis on uh, regeneration of uh, hair cell function in chicken that I did in Philadelphia. And I also had a birthday, and the team and House uh, um, Ear Institute was, uh, House Ear Clinic was very welcoming, and they actually gave me a cake uh, to my birthday, so I had a good time there. We still connected somehow to uh, House Ear Institute. Uh, last year, we published um, a, a paper on metabolic rope reprogramming of inner hair cell lines with the House Ear Institute um, organ of corti cell line after dexamethasone application. So there is some connections, although I haven't been there for 23 years. These are my disclosures. Um, I mainly advise cochlear implant companies or uh, uh, companies um, interested in drug delivery to the inner ear. Also an interest that I share with uh, Dr. Slattery. Uh, I will only uh, mention one non-FDA approved use. This is a custom made device, a perimodial or malleable cochlear implant surgery. Um, just briefly, Halle. Halle is an old university town in the middle of Germany, uh, about one hour south of Berlin. Um, and uh, the great son of the city is Georg Friedrich Händel. Uh, people from London, of course, say that's her hand, uh, th uh, their handle, but I think it's our handle because he was born here. And this is our university part. We are also very proud uh, about uh, this person, Dorothea Christiane Erksleben. She, um, is, um, um, she was the first woman in Germany who received a uh, doctoral degree in medicine, and that was in 1754, and that was in Halle. Uh, here are some impressions from Halle. We have a river with an old castle. Then we have this uh, old museum, the oldest uh, historical museum in, uh, in, in Germany with the Nebraskaitis. Then the German Academy of Science is hosted in Halle. And this is the marketplace with the five towers. And the, the Carillon um, is very famous because it has 76 church bells and gives regular concerts. Halle also is, um, has an historical background in ENT. Uh, the first hospital that was built in Germany for our later specialty ear, nose, and throat was the Royal Eye and Ear Hospital in Halle Saale. So that's where I am. And this is the original, and it's still uh, existing. You see here the, the men's ward uh, of this hospital in 1884. The first chairman was Hermann Schwarze. And most people know him because uh, of his uh, continuous work on, on mustard uh, surgery. Sometimes he's called the father of modern mustard surgery. He introduced uh, the chisel and gauche, uh, gauche in uh, mustard surgery. And um, he developed clear indication criteria that are still valuable today, like mustarditis or cholesteatoma. 
And he also founded, uh, together with Anton von Trolch and Adam Politzer, Anton von Trolch in Würzburg and Adam Politzer in Wien, Vienna, he uh, founded the Archive, uh, Archive for Urnalkunde or Archive of Otology in 1864, which was the world's first scientific journal solely dedicated to the field of ENT. And today it's the auto, uh, European Archives of Otorhinolaryngology and also the German speaking HNO. And last, one last person that uh, you, of course, uh, in the House Ear um, Foundation are uh, known, uh, know, um, at least um, uh, Bill House often cited Rudolf Panzer um, from Dresden, but he was the first Oberarzt, the first attending of uh, Hermann Schwarze in Halle. And uh, he was always cited as the one who did the first um, a translab surgery to the internal auditory canal to remove acoustic neuroma. However, he didn't do it in a person. He didn't do it in a living uh, person, but in um, in a cadaver. So he was a patholog uh, ENT doctor and pathological anatomist. And he indeed described the, uh, in his 1904 publication, the approach that is basically still valid today. And uh, we want to start the lecture, of course. It's about management of intralabyrinthine cochlear vestibular schwannomas, including hearing rehabilitation with cochlear implants. Intralabyrinthine schwannomas um, are benign tumors that arise within the inner ear from the distal branches of the cochlear or vestibular nerves. Here, for instance, the apex of the cochlear or here in the vestibule. And they occur in one or more turns of the cochlear, the modialis, the vestibule, or the crystal, or the macula. Um, these um, um, entities are not new. As soon as there were microscopes, they were basically uh, described in pathological specimens. That is, uh, uh, that is an uh, article from 1915 uh, with uh, a case of myrtle the tumors in the peripheral branches of the nervous acousticus, acoustic nerve. And you see these beautiful drawings here. You see the cochlea here, the second turn, and then these are enlargements with these uh, tumors here, even multiple tumors uh, are here. And some of them are so lowly in the scale. So they are not, uh, some of them are not in the modulus, which is interesting because that means we can take them out. Um, these, uh, this is the classification as proposed by Van Abel. There are from uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester in 2013. There are some other similar classifications too. I'll introduce this one. and. Uh, we have intravestibular tumors, intracochlear tumors, intravestibular cochlear tumors, transmodular growth, transmacular growth. Then they can grow into the uh, tympanic cavity or um, here translabyrinthine. I don't know whether they really exist, but uh, phenomenologically they can be described. And of course, they can grow into the cerebolopentine angle. What is interesting is that. Um, different to the internal order canal schwannomas, here in the labyrinth, 60 to 80% are uh, arising in the cochlear part, so in the acoustic nerve, so actually cochlear schwannomas. Um, the question, is this a rare disease? Is this as rare as we think? Um, Kasselmann, for instance, from, uh, so, uh, from uh, Belgium said, that probably one in 10 vestibular schwannomas or one in 10 cochlear vestibular schwannomas are intralabyrinthine schwannoma. I'm not sure, but uh, they're definitely more often than we think. Um, the localization is more often the cochlear. In our case series, it's about 51%. And then uh, every fifth uh, vestibular uh, schwannoma, and then another 12% that account also to the cochlea arising one intravestibular cochlea, I think. Uh, hearing loss is uh, almost all present in all cases, even with very small tumors, three, four millimeters, people have usually severe to profound hearing loss. Um, in my experience, the most often um, misdiagnosis is recurrent sudden hearing loss. It can be acute, it can be fluctuating. I also have patients with mixed or combined hearing loss, meaning there is a cytoconductive, pseudoconductive hearing loss. Vertigo instability uh, have a mixed picture. This is most more frequently than a norm, uh, common or classical vestibular schwannoma in the internal order canal. And in my experience, the most uh, often misdiagnosis is Meniere's disease. 
Tinnitus, interestingly, is often pulsating, and this is probably due to the mass in the um, in the um, the volume mass in in the scala. Here's another old um, um, publication from 1929 from Whitmark, and this um, article actually goes about uh, Meniere's disease. So uh, Whitmark uh, describes a patient uh, with Meniere's disease. And he describes the treatment and the symptoms. And then he shows this picture from, um, from the pathological section when the patient was dead. And you see the tumor in the scala tympani and scala vestibuli. And he, he explicitly said there was no tumor in the modialis. So this was a patient with deafness, uh, spinning vertigo attacks, Meniere like, uh, but the tumor was also in the cochlea. So the symptoms with these uh, tumors definitely vary. Here, for instance, we have a low frequency hearing loss uh, patient with Meniere's disease, diagnosed with Meniere's disease. This patient has a low and high frequency hearing loss and um, um, a sudden hearing loss um, and, and vertigo. Uh, this patient uh, was um, diagnosed with recurrent sudden hearing loss for two years, no vertigo. And this patient as a young fellow had a rapidly progressive hearing loss over five months and no vertigo. And if you look at the MRIs, these are all T1 gadolinium enhanced sections, uh, axial, and you all see tumor in the vestibule and in the lateral canal or the, the posterior canal. So the, the, the clinical picture can be completely different in different tumors, for instance. Also interesting here, uh, as, a, as a finding is um, increased VEMPs, as uh, similar as in supracanal dehiscence syndrome in some patients with intracatular schwannoma. So we have measured these VEMPs, enhanced VEMPs. Um, we don't have a really good explanation so far. So far we think it's probably micromechanical or fluid mechanical um, issues that uh, uh, cause these enhanced VEMPs in purely intracochlear schwannomas. Um, the um, gold standard is MRI, uh, thin slices, uh, gadolinium enhanced. And you see here actually a publication from the uh, House um, Foundation. Uh, here, the gadolinium enhanced one with the mass in the vestibule and then the filling defect in the T2, in the T2 sequence. How do we approach these tumors? In my opinion, they are completely different than the classical vestibular schwannomas in the internal order canal. Um, uh, and I will talk about this in my talk um, um, in the slides that come. As in all benign lesions or schwannomas, we have the option to do something or to do nothing. Nothing means in, in that case, wait and test and scan. And then if you do something, we can do radiotherapy, maybe also radiotherapy therapy in combination with surgery, and maybe also cochlear implantation, and then different types of surgical approaches, just surgical tumor removal, maybe with a dummy electrode, maybe with a cochlear implant, or incomplete surgical tumor removal, for instance, in transmodular tumors, maybe, or no surgical tumor removal at all, just pushing the cochlear implants through the tumor. And all, all of these things have been done, and I would like to go through with you through some cases and then discuss uh, what best to do later on. So wait and test and scan. In my, um, in my experiments and from the literature, if you do this, we have tumor growth and loss of function. Here is, for instance, a patient presenting in Berlin to an NT doctor with sudden hearing loss, mid-frequency, um, and uh, on the right side, uh, major cochlear hearing loss. And then over a couple of years, this patient um, had um, progressive hearing loss. And after 10 years, the patient was completely deaf. So this was um, the MRI from 2015. And you see the uh, tumor filling the entire cochlea. And if you go back to the MRI 2005, you already see this two millimeter white dot here in the uh, second turn, basically responsible for this medial cochlear hearing loss. So there was a slow growth um, and a slow loss of function, but you can also have rapid loss of function. This is a patient, for instance, with a mild hearing loss uh, in January, 
And uh, then um, this uh, more severe hearing loss was actually a pseudoconductive hearing loss in the low frequencies in October and complete deafness in December 2013. And this is the tumor and the filling the basal turn near the round window, the entire basal turn. Um, the problem can also be that the tumor grows into the vestibule. This is a patient, for instance, who had um, um, presented to another university department in Germany with um, asking for a cochlear implant, and they said, we can't do anything because there's a tumor filling the entire cochlea. At that point, the patient didn't have any dizziness. Um, one year later, uh, your observation at the other location, the tumor grew into the vestibule, the patient got dizziness, and this is when he approached me, it was uh, further growth in the vestibule and Meniere's disease, drop attacks, Meniere's disease, spinning attacks, he couldn't basically work anymore, he was out of work, he, he, he couldn't conduct his life anymore because he has severe Meniere's disease, so, or Meniere's like symptoms. Um, and um, you see, so the tumor can grow into the vestibule, but also what can happen, the tumor can grow through the medialis into the internal artery canal. This is a patient who presented again to another hospital in 2014. There it was observed until 2018. Um, and during observation here, the tumor grew into the um, uh, internal artery canal. And this is uh, how the patient then presented to me with a transmodular tumor growth in 2020, over six years. Um, I think weight and test and scan can be an option in patients where there's no vertigo and there's only partial hearing loss. Here, this patient, for instance, she has a fluctuating hearing loss. Um, she has a, a tumor in the vestibule and she has cochlear high drops here. Um, very likely secondary high drops due to this tumor mass in the vestibule. And this is her audiogram and uh, she has contrast on norm acousis, so she doesn't want to do anything. This is another patient with a transmodular tumor, so we had the tumor here in the basal turn a little bit, and, and then also already in the modiolus. The maximum monosyllable word recognition is 90%, and this is her pure tone um, audiogram. She has no vertigo, and we decided to just observe this tumor. So uh, to summarize the weight and test and scan, I think in most cases, weighting in these tumors makes things just more complicated. We have rapid, usually rapid progress of uh, 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 loss of function, if there's intracochlear growth, if we wait, um, um, the cochlea will be filled by the tumor. And if we then at some point want to rehabilitate the patient with a cochlear implant, the more tumor we have to take out, the more we have to destroy, and that's probably bad. If the tumor grows in the vestibule, uh, then it may cause dizziness and vertigo. Not in all patients, um, but in some patients, the um, the vestibular function will go down slowly, but in, in some patients, they will get severe vertigo attacks. And if you have transmodular uh, growth into the internal artery canal, um, then we basically have to do a transotic or translabyrinthine and transotic approach for complete tumor removal. Uh, so if we do tumor, uh, complete tumor removal, we cannot uh, do a rehabilitation with a cochlear implant. So weight and test and scan, I think only if there's no dis disabling symptoms like vertigo and severe tinnitus, if the hearing is still good, that was about 5% in our patients, and, um, and or if they don't want any hearing rehabilitation with a cochlear implant, or of course, if this is a, a financing issue by the health insurance. Radiotherapy. Um, the reports are very limited. I've uh, here listed a couple of the very few reports on gamma knife therapy. Um, I think it's not a good idea because the tolerance dose of the sensory and ganglion cells um, of the inner ear is much smaller than those than the dose for the that's needed for the tumor control. So um, even the possibility of hearing rehabilitation with a cochlear implant after radiotherapy appears unlikely. If we take, if we radiate the tumor, because we think that the neural structures, the spiral ganglion cells, will be 
basically damaged or killed by the radiation therapy. So I think it's only an option in growing transmodular tumors or large tumors in older patients without vertigo, but that might be discussed. Surgical tumor removal. Um, um, there's different options. Let's start with um, just normal surgical tumor removal. This is a patient, 51 years old. He presented with right tinnitus in the 90s, early 90s, and MRI showed no pathologic findings. And then he was deaf in 1994. Again, another MRI showed no pathologic findings. And then in 2015, the, he had tinnitus on the other side, and um, the MRI showed a transotic schwannoma from the CPA to the eardrum. So here, this is the middle ear, the tumor in the middle ear, the carotid artery, the tumor on the right middle ear. It actually grew through the lateral canal, uh, also um, has eroded the labyrinth, and here in the internal artery canal and then the CPA. So in this case, um, um, the, we opted for a normal uh, uh, translabyrinthine um, vestibular schwannoma removal, uh, also a, with a ear canal closure and a lateral pterygectomy. Um, then surgical removal with a dummy electrode. And this patient I showed you, this is this uh, colleague from Berlin, one of our first patients. And she didn't want to have a cochlear implant because at that time they weren't MRI suitable or not, not really good MRI suitable. And she was afraid of not being able to follow up. So she said, let's do a dummy electrode first. Um, so we took out here the entire um, uh, the tumor. This is an endoscopic view. You have the, the right ear, facial nerve, stapes, and the, the cochlea basically gone. There's only the stump of the medialis. We put in a dummy electrode. Um, she never came back for a cochlear implant. She, she married and they now have five or six kids. So she's busy and she doesn't have time for a cochlear implant. So I don't know whether it would be possible. We closed it. This is the tumor. Um, um, and uh, what was interesting in her when I saw her again, that she was riding her bike through Berlin. And I was a little surprised, but we found almost normal calorics and uh, normal V hit afterwards in the lateral canal, but I thought it was an, um, just an exemption, but I will tell you about later. So then next is surgical room, tumor removal and cochlear implantation or incomplete removal or neurosurgical. So cochlear implantation. There's a lot of publications now out there. I'm usually case reports or small uh, case series. So we are not the only one doing this, but it has been reported by others too. Um, so um, what about no surgical tumor removal, just leaving the tumor in there and pushing a cochlear implant through? It actually has been described at least by two um, um, groups. One is from the Mayo Clinic um, in Rochester, who described in 2016 cochlear implantation in patients with intracochlear insular labyrinthine schwannomas. These were 10, 10 patients, um, and seven of them were... Um, and NF2 patients with secondary, not primary, but secondary um, intralabine schwannomas, and eight um, of the entire group had good open word recognition. However, in two cases, they needed uh, to use a second cochlear implant because the first insertion attempt failed. So it's obviously not that straightforward to push a cochlear implant through the tumor. You probably have to leave the stylet in in a contour advanced um, electrode, for instance, um, uh, but even then you might uh, have to waste uh, about $20,000 for a second cochlear implant because uh, you encounter problems. The other group is from the, um, this is the, um, the Cambridge group, the Cambridge Skull Base Center, uh, in with eight patients with um, NF2, and they said the cochlear implant would be uh, uh, effective but previous treatment with radiation may be related to elevated current requirements. So um, um, I don't know how well they actually did these patients. So now uh, tumor removal in um, um, with uh, uh, cochlear implantation with tumor removal, if there's an intravestibular schwannoma, of course, this is a rather straightforward uh, procedure. Here, for instance, you have the tumor in the 
a vestibule and in the canals here again, a transmastoid view, the facial nerve, the posterior tympanotomy, the tumor and the vestibule, and then in the canals, as you can also here see. And this patient uh, received a labrodectomy, tumor removal, and a cochlear implantation. And uh, he is as the results for Germany, this is standard results with cochlear implant, absolutely average, six, a, a little above average, 65% monosyllables and quiet at 65 dB or 100% multisyllable numbers. And then um, uh, smaller intracochlear schwannomas, uh, they're not filling the entire um, uh, cochlea. We can usually um, uh, solve with an extended cochleostomy or the partial cochleectomy maybe with assistance by a mini endoscope. So here, for instance, we have a small uh, tumor about eight millimeters in the basal turn, uh, starting from the round window. And this patient uh, was deaf and had no vertigo. And um, here we have an intraoperative view in this left ear. So this is the facial nerve, the tensor tympani tendon is um, uh, cut that, uh, so I can uh, move the malleus handle forward. This is the modialis. This is a tumor in the basal turned around window. And then here the tumor is removed. And here we say scalar tympani, scalar vestibuli. And now it would be interesting to, um, to see whether there's any tumor in there. So we use this mini endoscope and uh, basically look here into the uh, scalar vestibuli, basal one membrane, or here the scalar, um, scalar tympani, and there's no visible tumors left. And then is the cochlear implant in situ. So the mandialis is completely preserved, and we only have this, you know, partial removal of the basal turn. Um, if we have larger tumors, there have been uh, in the cochlea. Um, we uh, use a technique in Halle that's called, well, I, I termed it subtotal cochleectomy. And if the tumor is also a labyrinth, then also a labyrinthectomy. Um, other have, uh, others have described pull-through techniques or push-through techniques. We also have applied these techniques in, in a small number of patients. Um, a colleague from Sydney also said beach towel or dental floss or pipe cleaner techniques. So these are synonyms. Um, um, so now um, our technique with the subtotal cochlectomy, here's an example. This is a 27 year old firefighter with a tumor on the left side. Uh, and he had some improvement after systemic high dose um, um, cortisone therapy. Also, uh, you see this uh, pseudoconductive hearing loss in the low frequencies. And this is the tumor in the basal turn, but also in the second turn and the apical was basically filling the entire inner ear. And here um, we have actually removed the round window arch, which I don't do anymore. And you see the tumor here um, in the anterior part of the basal turn, and then it goes behind or middle to the medial. So the question is what to do. So, um, the uh, apex actually in the, uh, the, the modalis in the second turn was somewhat destroyed and uh, we removed the tumor and only this part of the modalis was left. So um, we didn't know whether the cochlear implant actually would work. As you can see, this cochlear implant electrode area is basically desperately hugging around the, the rest of the modalis here. And then it's closed with this cartilage um, uh, perichondrium um, uh, transplant, and that's how it looks, and then a little um, fibrin clue and uh, bone pate. The quarter tympani, we can usually, here it, it looks a little dry, but usually we can now even preserve the quarter tympani uh, frequently uh, through a transmeatal approach. And this was um, after six weeks, 55% monosyllables, which is already you know, a good result, 80% numbers. And he's now stable for many years, almost five years now with 80% monosyllables, which is definitely above average and 100% numbers. And I told him to not ride his bicycle because he might be dizzy because of the cochlear removal. And he rode his motorbike because he wasn't dizzy. And this is his V-hit. It's not perfect, but it's much better than I thought after this type of surgery.
Another case, this again was a colleague from the south of Sherman, Germany with sudden deafness, pulsating tinnitus and two episodes of brief vertigo. And you see the small tumor here in the medial turn, basically. And this is uh, the transmeatal through, uh, transmeatal view uh, into the cochlea, partially open. This is basal turn scalar tympani, basal turn scalar vestibuli, basal membrane. And this is second turn um, basilar membrane. So there's no tumor. Tumor actually is here medial to the medialis. So we open the second turn further. This is the stapis, the corda, and anterior superior to the stapis in the second turn, a scala vestibular. Actually, we find this tumor. And um, so we remove these tumors. We preserved the basal turn medialis. The second turn medialis took off the apical. Um, um, portion of the medialis. Here is a closer view, and the tumor is actually small, just a six, five, six millimeter tumor. And this is the cochlear implant electrode. And I think this is important. These cartilage chips that we use to uh, again or uh, additionally approximate the cochlear implant electrode to the medialis. And uh, yeah. And this is again the cartilage uh, perichondrium compound transplant. And this patient um, um, also had almost no vertigo afterwards. This is her, um, um, her V hit three days postoperative. There's you know some uh, saccades, and this is six days um, after um, after surgery. And um, so this is interesting. If you um, if you're interested in the technique, we have uh, published a surgical video article for otology and neurotology. And um, let's just go through the um, um, most important steps uh, here um, um, in a sequence of these uh, objects.
this would be a cartoon showing a cross section of the um, of the technique. So this is the stump of the modiolus with most Bargangian cells being in the first and second turn. And these are cartilage pieces approximating uh, the uh, electrode uh, uh, array to the modiolus and the cells. And this is the cartilage. I actually uh, rarely use bone pate now, bone pate nowadays. And this is the silicon foil. Um, you can also use um, um, other electrodes, of course. Here, for instance, this is uh, from uh, another company, a Form 19 electrode with a nitinol shape uh, memory wire. Uh, and we now we here produced a, basically a preformed electrode that's perimodiola. We did this at that time because this company was the only one who had an, a magnet that was well MRI compatible, but now uh, other companies also have these uh, compatible um, uh, MRI compatible magnets. So it's um, a little easier to have a already preformed electrode. Um, rarely, but possible is multilocular tumors, meaning in the inner ear and separate in the IAC or the CPA. And uh, here, for instance, we also did complete tumor removal. Um, here is um, from the uh, Schuknecht book. There is a, um, a histological section with a tumor in the apical turn and a second tumor, a second vestibular spinoma from the vestibular nerve in the internal auditory um, uh, canal. And um, we had uh, two patients with this. This is, for instance, one case with a large vestibular spinoma in the CPA in 2011. Um, and this was removed uh, by our new research in 2012 with some hearing preservation. And then the patient uh, lost basically um, the rest of his hearing or was non-functional. They did another MRI and it showed this tumor here in the apical and uh, second turn. And when we got, went back to 2012, the tumor was already there. And then actually 2011 pre-op, the tumor was already there. So we had a vestibular spinoma and a cochlear spinoma in the same patient. Here's an interoperative view. This is the apex of the cochlea opened with the tumor here in the apex. This is the uh, tumor here in the further opened cochlea. This is the promontory, the stapes uh, remnants, the facial nerve, ten, um, tensor tympani muscle. So here's the tumor. And this is the tumor removed in the cochlear implant uh, ele electrode area in situ. And this patient actually had pretty good results already six weeks and especially four years after uh, cochlear implantation with 75% monosyllables, which is definitely above average for German standards. Um, so it's interesting, this patient survived two, two or this, uh, this hearing organ survived two tumors and survived two surgeons, actually. Um, and then there's a complicated group of tumors. These are the primary transmodular tumors or secondary infiltrative schwannomas. So for instance, NF2 patients going from the canal to the um, inner ear. So if you want uh, hearing rehabilitation, these patients, of course, it's not possible to remove the entire tumor because then all the... Um, all the uh, spiral ganglion cells would be gone and no cochlear implant rehabilitation would be possible. Here is a case, for instance, um, um, who was uh, operated by the neurosurgeons through a retrosegmental approach, um, but they missed parts of the in the cochlea, so that there was tumor in the cochlea. And um, in this patient, we actually did this uh, pull through technique. So we had two holes here in the cochlea. We, need, we knew that we had uh, to leave tumor behind. So we uh, used this proline thread with a knot. I don't do, I don't do this in, anymore because the subtotal cochlectomy is, works well, very well in my hands. And so I, I stopped doing this uh, uh, pull through technique, for instance. Um, but also this patient with tumor uh, cells um, remaining in the modiolus has good results with 75% monosyllables um, after 12 months, which is a very good result. This patient is a, a young, um, a relatively young person with a severe NF2. Um, 
The, the left-sided tumor was operated by our neurosurgeon, Halle Professor Strauss, and the uh, cochlear nerve, of course, was gone. You could preserve the facial, though. And then um, on the right side, still a large tumor. Uh, he did a tumor debulking because there was some residual hearing. Um, this was stable over some years, and the patient, when he lost his hearing due to an intracochlear, secondary intracochlear tumor growth of the tumor, asked for um, a cochlear implantation. So uh, here is an intracochlear fluor, transmeatal view. This is the basal turn with the tumor in the basal turn and relatively free uh, second turn. And there um, we push the tumor through. You use the push-through technique with a dummy electrode. And this is also described in this um, um, article here um, uh, with, um, with a video actually in the article through a QR code. But I, due to time reasons, I won't show this. Here is the dummy electrode pushing the tumor through from the basal turn into the second tum turn. And then this is the tumor removed and the cochlear implant electrode in there before um, uh, closure. Uh, this is the intraoperative EABR. Uh, it looks strange, long latencies, and not very nice wave twos. However, this patient was one of the most happy patients I ever saw uh, and met in my life. He had 60% monosyllables at um, um, 12 uh, six weeks and uh, two years, uh, and still uh, three or four years, we are now into 90%, still 90% monosyllables at 65 dB. So he's one of our best performers, actually, and he still has a lot of tumor in his CPA um, and internal order canal. So um, it's strange, but uh, also these good things happen. Transmacular tumors, are also relatively straight forward for uh, skull-based surgeons. Uh, this is a, 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 a patient here, 25 years with sudden fluctuating hearing loss. You see the low frequency hearing loss, then the deafness, and then improvement one month later. Uh, he had this uh, high drops in the cochlea, and on top of that, this tumor in the vestibule, in the superior, and the um, lateral canal and also growth of tumors along the superior in, uh, vestibular nerve into the internal order canal. So this is uh, the uh, opening the labyrinth. You see the tumor in the right vestibule. And then here you see this tumor growing into the fundus or in the direction of the fundus of the internal canal along the superior vestibular nerve. And then here the internal order canal is open, the tumor in the fundus needs to be scraped off basically from the facial nerve. And then this is to preserve facial nerve and a small opening only of the internal order canal, of course, and then the cochlear implant in there. So to summarize uh, my results, the um, two-way technique, so the mastectomy for the cochlear implant and the transmeatal approach to the tumor in my hands works very well and we got good results. This is a, a one-year follow-up, post typical post-op uh, follow up after transmeatal tumor removal, it rather looks like ear surgery, tympanoplasty, and uh, you don't see that we were actually in the cochlea. And these are our cases. So we have now a total um, that is uh, as of March, we have some more patients now, um, but not operated yet. So this is uh, 85 patients as of March 2022. 51% uh, were um, intracochlear, 14% intravestibular, 9% intravestibular cochlear, and then 15% uh, transmodular. And uh, then the other entities were rather rare. We operated 69 and 64 received a cochlear implant. And um, uh, we got pretty good results with respect to the uh, monosyllables. Um, here, um, these three groups are a little below average, and these are a little above average. Um, if you look at the um, uh, time course of rehabilitation, so this would be monosyllable word recognition at 65 dB in percent. And this is um, rehabilitation uh, after implantation 12 to 24 months. 
And uh, the lower curve is the monosyllables and the uh, open circles is the multisyllable numbers. So if we look at these data um, and for the different groups, so the best group is definitely our intracochlear tumor group. So this is the red curve. And then um, this is um, the um, um, intravestibular um, cochlear tumors, the intravestibular tumors, and the transmodular up are the, the black curve. And um, this is from a publication uh, two years ago where we looked at um, a very um, um, uniform cohort of soloily intracochlear tumors. Um, or intravestibular cochlear schwannomas uh, with a contour advanced electrodes and follow up over 12 months. And this um, is again the word recognition scores depending on the time course. Um, and um, um, so the partial resection of the basal turn wall for the small cochlear um, um, intracochlear schwannomas, they do definitely the best. If you can preserve first and second term modalis, you also get very good results here above 80% monosyllables. And even if we can only preserve the first term modalis, we get still average cochlear implant um, results uh, for Germany. For a near total cochlearectomy, this was a patient where there was only a small part of the basal um, turn um, preserved. Uh, the results were not as good, the one patient. So the question is, I showed you this result before, why do these intracochlear tumors do so well? And we have, I think, an explanation for this. Here we measured um, trans impedance matrix uh, measures um, in the cochlea. So these are 20 patients with a tumor removed from the cochlea and then uh, the cochlear implant and the cartilage approximation. And this is normal uh, cochlear implants, so with intact uh, cochlea through the round window usually. And if you compare those, this is after regular cochlear implantation, this is after subtotal cochlearectomy, you see that trans impedance matrix show less spread of electric field after cochlear implantation and tumor removal, especially here in the in the basal parts uh, of the cochlea, there is smaller or narrower spread of electric field. And that's why I think um, we have a better channel separation and a better speech understanding in these patients than in normal um, uh, cochlear implant users. Another interesting thing is the vestibular function of the subtotal cochlearectomy. Um, you, this is a rather uh, traumatic surgery and not uh, a traumatic surgery when we take out basically this part of the cochlea. The question is why would this, um, or a, does this part of the inner ear still function? And yes, we could show this. This is a cartoon of the inner ear with the different receptors. And we could show that the saculus is working after surgery in a cord of uh, 27 patients and almost all of them, 25, 27 patients, which could show that the saculus is working, the utricle is working, the anterior canal is working, the posterior canal is working, the lateral canal is working with VHEAD and with Calorix, no spontaneous nystagmus, and as I've shown you, very good results for word recognition. So the question is why, uh, I, at least I was very surprised. There are some people who say, well, yeah, I can imagine this, but I was very surprised. And I think um, there are three reasons why this is possible to preserve the vestibular function after this um, traumatic cochlear surgery. One is anatomy, then physiology and evolution or changes. Let's talk about anatomy first. So this is a, um, um, a cartoon by uh, Maloney from Brödel in 1946. And it's about the canalis reunions, so the connection between the cochlea and vestibular part of the inner ear. This is a 3D reconstruction from Smith, uh, Christopher Smith from New York and see the cochlea. Then this yellow part is the ductus reunions here that connects the endolymphatic space of the cochlea with the vestibule. And here he looked at the ductus reunion even uh, closer. And uh, at the narrowest part, the ductus reunion is only 0.14 millimeters. And um, so this probably closes or shrinks or, or maybe 
for good luck, I, I, I closed it with some soft tissue. Here's an anatomical view. This would be a transmatal view. So we look into the matus, we see the, um, um, the incus, the corda, the promontory of the right ear, and then the uh, round window, the promontory overhang is drilled away. This is the round window. And at the posterior postis, so here at the posterior part of the round window, you see the ductus reunion. So it's very close here. And this would be a posterior tympanotomy view. So um, um, again, the uh, ductus reunions is a posterior part of the round window. Uh, so that might be important to consider when we do round window surgery, that we watch the posterior part and don't drill away too much, uh, at least not further than the uh, level of the round window. I don't want to go into much detail about physiology, but there's definitely some very um, interesting uh, data on why the vestibular uh, labyrinth works by its own. There's a lot of data that there are sufficient endolymph generating cells in the vestibular labyrinth to keep the vestibular sensory organ functioning. So it makes sense. And also it makes sense from a development point of view. Uh, the vestibular receptors are phylogenetically much older than the acoustic receptors. So it obviously was more important that we work straight than we could hear each other. To summarize and follow up, um, I would like to um, uh, say something about radiological follow up. Um, it has been described by the uh, Mayo group uh, that you can do MRIs after cochlear implantation. Also, we have good um, images here uh, from the internal auditory canal and transmodular tumors with cochlear implant in place. What is important that you go about three to three to five inches uh, from the external auditory canal with your magnet. So the magnet needs to bite nine centimeters or three to three five inches away from the external order canal. And um, yeah, what's the risk of regrowth? We don't have any data on that yet uh, so far. This is a, a study by Boston and Zurich group with sex temporal bone specimens, four times intracochlear and two times intravestibular. And two had involvement of modiolus and two had not uh, involvement of the modiolus in the intracochlear tumor. So the very careful conclusion could be that 50% of the intracochlear uh, schwannoma are also in the modiolus, or all but apical intracochlear schwannomas are in the modiolus. But this is very, very careful, uh, this conclusion, because it's just four patients. Um, um, conclusions. The incidence of intralabrine schwannomas is most likely underestimated. The most often misdiagnoses are idiopathic sudden sensory hearing loss and Meniere's disease. So I think it's very important that in patients with cochlear vestibular symptoms, we have to explicitly search via MRI and specifically ask the radiologist for an intracochlear schwannomas and look ourselves, of course, double check them. And yeah, um, most tumors grow, but some very slowly, but they can become very large. Uh, usually they um, lead to profound hearing loss over time, often rapidly. Um, sporadic vestibular schwannomas and intralabrinic schwannomas might present at the same time. Waiting test and scan is an option. However, I think for intracochlear intralabrinic schwannomas, waiting for growth is not advisable since the cochlea is a housing, is necessary for cochlear implantation, and we do not want to have any growth from the inner ear to the internal auditory canal. So I think in general, waiting makes things just more complicated. Radiotherapy, I do see the radiotherapy role only in very limited cases. So in my opinion, if we have functional deaf deafness, meaning unserviceable hearing class C and D, or in Germany, a word recognition score, a maximum word recognition score of less than 60%, and or vertigo or devastating tinnitus, I would suggest to do a surgical tumor removal with cochlear implantation. And the cochlear implantation works astonishingly well in these patients. So Again, in general, I think in these tumors, other than in vestibular schwannomas and internal auditory canal, treat when still small, treat young, treat early. I think it's amazing how much surgeon and inner ear can take. Why do the cochlear implant work so astonishingly well? I think the spiral ganglion cells in this kind of hearing loss are healthy and present in sufficient numbers. 
the blood supply is not uh, so compromised as in other diseases like in inner ear apoplex. Uh, most spinal ganglion cells are on the basal and middle turn of the cochlea. And we also approximate, approximate the electrodes to the mediolus. And most importantly, after, their, in, after this kind of surgery, there is no salty fluid less, there's no shortcuts, there's less current spread, and probably also a reduced spread of electric fields in the spiral ganglion cells. It also shows, in my opinion, that the course of deafness is more important for hearing outcome with the cochlear implant than the degree of hearing loss and maybe even the degree of surgical trauma. And the vestibular labyrinth can work independently from stereovascularis. Multilocular ipsilateral tumors, they do exist, even without further clinical science um, or genetic analysis of NF2. And the auditor system can survive two tumors and two surgeons. Transmodular infiltrative tumors are very difficult, though um, uh, removal of intralaryngeal portion only means that the cochlear implant works. Um, and also, uh, debulking of the internal audio canal CBA tumor. Uh, we only have very limited um, but very good experience in these cases. And also, MRI follow up is possible with modern implants with modern magnets and distant placement of the magnet. So I think this is not an issue anymore um, with respect to follow-up. Um, I thank uh, our entire audiology team. We have now four medical physicists um, who are very uh, helping or are doing um, a lot of these analysis and my collaborators from Denmark, from neurosurgery, from radiology, pathology, biology, and also for the vestibular tests in Sydney and for the bone conduction in Gothenburg. And I thank you for your interest in listening to me for almost an hour. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.